One of the biggest challenges home gardeners face is basically controlling pests. While you're there beefing up yourself to actually eat the lush fruits that will come from your garden, insects are, are gearing up to do the same thing. So in other words, you'll be competing for the things you've worked so hard to achieve and to grow in your garden. There are different types of pests. One such category are insects. Now, insects behave in different ways. Sucking insects. These will suck the sap from your plant, making the plant weaker and more vulnerable to, pest, to other pests and diseases. Examples of sucking insects will include your aphids and your white flies. Now, there are other insects that feed by chewing off parts or portions of your plant. And this reduces the ability of the plant to produce food in a process called photosynthesis. Now, if the plants don't have enough leaves to, to, to attract sunlight, then your plants will be non-productive. Now, examples of these insects include uh, moths or butterfly larvae. And what they basically do is to lay their eggs on the plant and as soon as your larva hatch they will eat the leaves and the fruits. Much of them don't will do very little damage in their adult stage. So what you need to look out for are their eggs and their larva or the worms. Other pests include your mealybugs, slugs and snails, nematodes and leaf miners. Leaf miners as their name suggests are miners. What they do they bore into the leaf and eat the leaf from inside out. Now you'll know you have leaf minor damage when you see pure veins. So they'll never exit that plant until the food is finished. Now walk with me and look at this example here. Now on this tomato plant, this is what a characteristic leaf minor damage will look like. Now this insect is inside there and what they do, they enter the plant and eat between the layers. So this will look like an eyeglass. When you hold it up to the sun, it will look like an eyeglass. Right? And that, when you see that, you'll know that you have leaf minor damage. Slugs and snails are heavy feeders. Now, slugs, you'll notice they'll walk, they crawl around. They don't have legs, so they crawl around. And when they crawl around, they will leave evidence. Right? And that is separate from snails, which they have shells. So once you see that snail, you will actually recognize that it's a snail. Now, walk with me and let, let me show you an example of what slug damage is like. Now, take for instance this cabbage plant. Now, if you look carefully, the shiny, shiny layer on your plant is evidence that a slug has been or a snail has been around. Now, they are heavy eaters. So when they eat, this is all that will left. That, this is all that will be left from your plant. Right? This, is, this was a previously a full leaf. This one is going and then they've started on this one. The important thing to know is that slugs are slugs and snails, they are nocturnal feeders. So you coming here today trying to look for a slug or a snail, it's impossible. You won't see them. They'll look for the cool of the night or cool places. That's, the, these cool places are created by plants with heavy leaves, lots of leaves on them, and they're cool places under debris. They, those are, are the places where they, will, where they will inhabit. Now, in the nights, they come out and they eat, and the only evidence you have to show that slugs and snails were present is the shiny covering from their tracks. We, we're going to be demonstrating to you how you identify um, if nematodes are present. Now, nematodes are soil-borne pests. Now, how, they, how nematodes do their damage, they basically will burrow into your roots, into the plant roots. Into the, when you root up a plant and you see that white section, these are the very nice succulent root tips that the nematode will, will inhabit. They are worm-like structures, but they are they're also microscopic, so you won't be able to see the actual nematodes with your naked eyes. And evidence of the presence of nematodes will be wilting of the plants. You'll have to do further research to know whether or not it is nematode or it's another pest that is causing the damage. Now, this is a pea plant. This is a pea. Now, if you want to know whether or not nematode is present, all you have to do is to remove 
that plant after seeing that the plant is wilting away. Now, if nematodes are present, what you'll see, what you'll see is nodules on the root, right? Now, this is what the nodule would look like, right? Now, red peas have a natural nodule. But just to demonstrate for you what the nodule would look like, this is an example of a nodule. So when the nematode inhabit the plant root, it will actually swell, right? And give you a nodule-like effect on the roots. Then you'll know that you have a nematode problem. This plant does not have nematode. Now, leguminous plants such as your beans and peas, they will actually have natural nodules on their roots. Right? That will help them to produce food and we'll tell you about that in, in later segments. Right? So you can be sure that this plant does not have nematode because it's healthy looking. Right? It's not wilting away. And that is, remember we said wilting is a, is a, is a sure sign that there is nematodes. But there are other insect pests that will cause it. So you have to go to the root nodules to find out whether or not it's real. Nematode is a real problem. Now this is an example of of leaf miner, right? What it, look at the tunneling effect that it, it causes. And it burrows through that plant and there is no set pattern. It just goes where the food is, where there is green fleshy part of the leaves that it can eat. After the challenge and the shortcomings is like seeing the thing come into perfection and by the quinta eye it come like you never do nothing. That, that is a pain you know and that is a main challenge look at this damage created here now this is an excellent example of leaf miner damage now if you notice if you hold this part a little bit to the sun then you can look straight through it realize the eyeglass looking effect they have eaten away all the green patches right eaten all, that's a food for them so they will be competing with you for your food that you have grown right Look at this healthy, well, once healthy colorless leaf. And this is what is left after a leaf miner attack. So every morning, you know, after going out you know, and pick up these, the worms, pick them up like this. See the worm in this, you know, worm close up himself into that. Right, that worm fall up in under that, you know. I have to throw them away sometimes and just hold it and squeeze it up and kill the worm. Kill the worm and then... Mealybugs are quite nasty insects. And these are sucking insects. They also suck the sap from your plant, suck the plant juice and discolor that plant, deform it, cause it to be susceptible to other diseases, to other pests and diseases. Now, Let's show you for demonstration purposes, this is a sweet sap, right? How many of you would love to have this sweet sap in your, in your garden? But what would make it a bit unattractive are those mealybugs that you find in between them. Even if you reap this fruit, you will not want to eat it with so many insects, well, mealybugs inside there. Now, you'll know that it mealybug, it's mealybug when it, it's appearing patches of white waxy layers right and fluffy so when you take for example you disturb them you'll find that pinkish looking pussy kind of looking uh body inside there now we're trying to find there are insects in there trust me and they'll eat away your plant right now another right Look, for example, this pinkish layer right there. You know that mealybug is present there, right? And you don't even have to remove that. You don't even have to, to go so close. As long as you see this whitey, white, fluffy looking, right? You know that it's there. Now, another feature of mealybugs is that, now, mealybugs will appear on your most succulent leaves like the top of the branch, and you'll just see it folding over, right, crinkling. You just see the leaves folding over, and then basically you'll know that the, 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 the pest is present.
Some birds will also trouble vegetables when they get to the fruiting or mature stage. Quite a few, like parakeets, love corn, for instance. Others love the young fruit. For bird press, you usually have no choice but to cover your plot with mesh, right? Or to keep them away. The concept of integrated pest management incorporates a number of things. Now, having recognized that planting healthy seedlings will enable your plant to live a healthier life and be able for the plant to, to basically help to fight against insects on its own. Also, good weed management. Some of the weeds that you'll have in your garden will actually cause problems. They'll host, they'll serve as hosts for other insects. And then those insects come over at night and they go away at, in the daytime. Other aspects such as good soil preparation, right? Good plant care, right? Those are all factors which integrated pest management involves or it integrates all of those to help to control your insect pests and to give your plants a fair start. As a last resort, even though it's a part of integrated pest management, pesticides are used. When you look on the label, you will see colorations, right? This is not, this is a green color on the label. Now the green means something. It corresponds with the, the phrase, right? Caution. Now if you have to use chemicals any at all, green is the way to go. Now, these chemicals are usually less harmful to the environment. Now, more harmful are your blue um, package. Now, this blue line signifies slightly hazardous. Now, it is a step up, more dangerous from your green. Now, also, you'll see these hazard symbols called, well, moderately hazardous. Now, mod moderately hazardous is still a step up from, um, from blue or slightly hazardous. Now, if you see red, red means stop. You have to think twice, you have to think thrice before you go on to using any chemical at all that bears that has that red ribbon on it. It means poisonous. All chemicals will cause some damage if you misuse them. And one of the most significant damage that pesticides can do. If you overuse or abuse your pesticides, any pest that survives from that overuse will now become resistant to that particular chemical. And that chemical can no longer be used to control those pests. What you'll have are rogue pests this time because you won't be able to control them any at all. You'll have to get rid of that entire field and start over again. Now there are added dangers to, 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 to pesticides. If you can imagine the, the, the harm that it will cause you if you try to use pesticides without the necessary protective clothing. Pesticides can also get into your rivers and streams and contaminate your, 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 your soil or the groundwater. Apart from contaminating your groundwater, pesticides serve as a deterrent to, to, to exploitation. Now, when you overuse pesticides, or you don't follow the directions properly or reap that crop before the chemical um, wears off or the chemical disintegrates into a less harmful compound. What will happen is that you'll have, it's more expensive to export your crops because now you'll have to waste time and money to get rid of that crop residue of the harvested crop before you e can export that crop. To, 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 to other countries. When we speak of exportation, you may think that it's far removed from yourself. Now, think of it as you are consuming that plant. In fact, most vegetable and plants that you'll grow in your garden, you will be consuming it. So, think about using pesticides and using it incorrectly. Now, that residue, pesticide residue that remains, will cause significant harm to you or your children or whoever partake of that vegetable or, 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 or crop. Now, pesticide can also cause immense damage if they are stored improperly. They can cause problems to children who will misuse them and also if they get in the way of animals, they can also be killed. So you'd want to think twice or thrice about using pesticides. 
there are a myriad of alternatives and we will explain how to do those. The best way to control pests is to be sure that you have a well-fed and healthy plant. If your soil is healthy, which means they are disease and pest free from the start, as we've shown you how to, then your plants will have a fair start at living a healthy life and producing good vegetables and fruits for you. It's a good habit to check your plants for pests and disease at least twice per week. Now, checking for pests and disease are quite tricky, but it can be made easy. Now, Come with me. Whenever you're checking for insect pests, remember as we mentioned before, a lot of insects are nocturnal, meaning they feed only at nights. They feed at nights and retreat to their living areas. Now, which means when you're looking for insect pests, insect and pests won't, it's hardly likely that you're going to be seeing insect pests on the open leaves as you, at first glance. So what you then need to do is to look for hiding places. Look for places that they will normally retreat to after they have had a belly full. Now, one such place is under, on the underside of the leaves. Now, if you can see clearly, you'll see some insects here. These are white flies. Now, look at them. These are white flies. Now, look again on the top, on the top side of the leaves. Do you see white flies present here? Look at how healthy this plant looks. So you do really don't have to wait until you see the insects present to start looking. Now let us take another leaf. Look on the underside of this leaf. Healthy looking on the top side, but on the, on the underside, white flies are doing a world of damage, right? Now there are other places you can look, right? To find insect pests. Now, especially when you have mulching taking place, when you mulch your garden as was discussed, Insect pests will live under these dry, well, moist and cool areas. So if there is damage on the upper leaves and you have not seen where that, pest have, uh, where that pest has retreated to, you can look in the mulched areas, right? We're looking. Now, all I'm seeing here are a few ants, right? And when you see ants, Ants are very beneficial insects. They, they too will consume some of the insect pests that, that bothers you. Uh, separate and apart from the, the, the good environment that mulches uh, create for your insects after they have had a belly full. Now, if you have stones in your garden, right? If you have stones in your garden, it means that those stones will create a microclimate, as we would call it, or a good environment where they the, the, the insects can retreat and feel cool in the day and rest off so that they can go and attack your plants in the night. So remember, the heat of the sun does not work well with insects. On the top of the leaf, as we showed you before, looking healthy, right? They, they look like healthy plants on the top of the leaves. Now, and on the underside is where the leaves, where the insects are basically doing the damage. So don't ever assume that there's no insect in your garden. You really need to check your plants at least twice per week to ensure that there are no pests there. And if they're there, then we'll show you how to get rid of them. Or simply pick them off and crush them under the feet. You know what? Kids, get the kids involved. They love this. You can basically puncture the insects or you can have a stampede. Put the insects on the ground and have your children stamp on them, crush them. And squish them out right this is an example of a green stink bug and this will suck the saffron plant right and how you know it's a green stink bug and why we call it a green stink bug if you touch this insect it will just give off a lot of odor stink right so basically what you need to do now is to get your kids involved hold him hold him all right wait, 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 wait. Pull it script. Right? Kids will just love doing that. Right? Alright, these are also stink bugs or what you call them sometimes mirror grudgeful. So 
basically they'll stick around. These are some examples that will feed any time of the day. They suck the juice away from the plant and then the plant will just start folding. Plant leaf will start folding. Right. This is an example of when a sucking insect has attacked your plant. If you notice, all you see, you see healthy looking greenish plant leaves. However, it's not as straight as the other leaves, right? So look at what happens. They suck the leaves from the, so this leaf from the underside, creating this bulgy look, right? It's no longer straight. So you know that there is a sucking insect when the plant leaves are looking uneven and crinkled and bundled. All right, this for example is a larval stage of an insect. And sometimes you can also get your kids involved again, as we said before. Now, kids will love to just squish this insect. This, look at where the insects have hidden. Where in this escalion root. So when you see these, you really don't have to rush the chemicals. All you need to do is to remove it, right? This is where it goes after it has eaten. So you have to remove and just search your plants every, well, twice per week. Right, and there you have it. Two less larvae to worry about. Not all insects are bad. We will tell you about getting to know your insect friends. These insects, which are dubbed the farmer's friend. The insects, the same insects that will eat the harmful ones, they will be more than happy to help you to get rid of those harmful insects or to manage them as integrated pest management will dictate. When we use these beneficial insects to control the harmful insects, we are, con we are practicing what is known as biological control. There are three basic types of pests. You have what is known as a parasitoid, you have what is known as a predator, and you have what are known as pathogens. The parasitoid will lay its egg on the egg of that pest, or it will lay it on the larva of that pest. When that, the egg of the parasitoid hatches, it will eat that egg before it reaches maturity, or if it hatches inside a larva, it will eat the larva from inside, thus killing it. Predators are usually larger than the pest itself. Now, what predators will do, they will basically search for that insect egg, or the, 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 the egg of the pest, or they'll just consume an entire larva, right? And thus wiping out those insects for you. Now, pathogens, which include bacteria, Fungi, fungi and viruses, they will infect the insect pest, much in the same way as, it, as bacteria, virus and fungi will harm the human body. And they will cause the same symptoms. They will cause the insect to, be, to perform slower. They will cause the insect to, 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 to eat your plant slower. They will cause them to be droopy, right? Much of the infestation by pathogen will actually kill the insects. If you see wasp, ladybirds, or spiders in your garden, don't worry. Be happy because they will help you to control the same pest that you are trying to control. No, the marigold is a flower that the scent of it actually repels most insects. The white flies, the aphids, and so forth, just the scent of it will prevent insects. So, so this is a, a good crop to just in, to incorporate with um, your plants, your, your tomato here, right, for containers or in a backyard. This is a good plant to incorporate to help just to, to repel those pests that will damage your crop, right? And I mean, it adds some beautification to it, right? So apart from the marigold, you can also, the skeleton, onions and so forth, it helps, the scent from it helps to prevent um, pest infestation. And also one key thing that a lot of persons don't know is what we call over here, 
the French thyme. Now one of the most plants that gives off a very strong scent. It helps to prevent insects, right? Because, I mean, just by coming close to this, you smell it. And most pests and so forth don't like this, so the scent itself keeps off these pests, right? So this is a good crop to incorporate. And I mean, you, in the morning, you can just come and pick a few leaves and you boil your tea, you season your meat, you have it, right? So it repels and it's still beneficial to you. Now this is what is actually a ladybird beetle, right? If you see this in your field, you don't want to kill it. If you're going to spray, try and collect them before you even do any spray and so forth. Because this eats one of those pests that damage our crop seriously, especially the, what we call the aphids. These little birds be to feed on the aphids. So you definitely don't want to destroy these bugs, right? Because these beetles are very ideal to control. It helps very much in your IPM measure to control your pests. So you definitely don't want to destroy that. They allow these to, to be grown in your field. Also, I want to show you that the corn. Corn is also ideal. That, that's why the little bird beet is on this, because the corn, especially for your plants like your hot pepper, your tomato, your sweet pepper, that is that aphids love. The, the aphids prefer the corn. Right? So if you plant the corn, just the corn around your, 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 your bed, your, your garden and so forth, the aphids will gravitate towards the corn. Right? So instead of going on the peppers to spread diseases and so forth. Right? And as we had shown, the ladybird beetle actually searching for aphids to feed on. So these are some of the beneficial um, insects, what we call the farmer's friend. They don't want to destroy these. A lot of people are not used to them, so when they see these type of um, insects, they, they feel that it's, it's a pest. But it's not really a pest, so that's why it's good to either call your, your extension officer or ask a master gardener to tell, just, to, just ask them, what, what is this? Is this a bad pest or so forth? So it's gone to feed somewhere else. Let me just um, discuss with you some home remedy pesticides that we can use to control most of our soft body insects like the aphids and the white flies, which is most common in backyard gardening. Sometimes I use chemical and the next time homemade remedy, which is garlic, hot peppers, blend, leave overnight for soak. And you mix it with water, liquid soap, and a tip of oil. And you shake and you spray it, but you have to spray it like maybe two times or three times per week, a week. While the chemical you can just spray it one time and leave it for, depends, seven or 14. It depends on the chemical. One simple measure that we can, that we can use is to use soap water. Um, soap, right? Whether you're dishwashing soap or so forth, with at least about five gallons of water. So what you need to do, two to three teaspoons, tablespoons, sorry, two to three tablespoons per gallon. And you want, you don't, remember, you don't want to add too much as too much may actually burn the plant. So that's one, two, three. I remember it's soup, so you can use your hand and stir it. I remember for home remedy pesticides, you need to apply them more often. You don't wait until you see a huge infestation. So this now, you just put this in your spray bottle and apply it. Ensure that you spray it the underside of the leaves, right? So these are where most insects would hide. So you ensure that in spraying, you spray on the underside of the leaves, right? And it's home ready, so you don't have to worry about your hand being contaminated or so forth, right? Other ways you can do is use minced garlic, minced onion with minced hot, um, hot pepper. Right, and it just allows it to seep, settle it in water, like for overnight and so forth. If you want, you can blend it together, right? And you use that, you put it in a spray bottle and spray, right? Another measure that most persons always be surprised when I say is the use of 
breakthrough leaves. Right? It's about one breadfruit leaf. What you actually, you just crush it and boil it. Just boil it for about 10 to 20 minutes. And afterwards, you allow that um, liquid to cool, that solution to cool. And then you use that solution to spray for white flies and so forth. And it's effective. I remember, always monitor your, your, your plants on a daily basis. You have your garden, you go inside of it, right? And you just don't, don't just look and say, okay, my plants is fine. You need to have a personal interaction with the plants. So you, you touch the plants, you just take the leaves, look on the underside, look for signs of insects, look for signs of insect bites and so forth, right? So you look on the underside. And if you have a time, you do it for every crop. If you don't have the time, you try to do it for at least 75% of your crops. Right? And you do it at every end of your bed. Right? Other measures that we encourage um, small backyard persons to do, especially like for skeletons that um, like the beet armworm loves. Right? We encourage you to practice what we call pheromone traps. Using pheromone traps, which is actually the, the, a trap that attracts a particular sex. It's the insects, whether the male or the female. Most times it's the male, right? The, the scent from the pheromone attracts the male and it eventually dies, right? I need to show you one more technique that um, we use, especially for slugs, slugs and snails to control them within the field. Because one thing I realize is that for beers, um, slugs like beer. That's the beer that you drink, right? Slugs love it. So we, I'm going to show you how to just set up a simple trap within your field to control them. Now this simple environmentally friendly way that we're going to use to control slugs and snails, which is actually one of the, 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 the harder pests to control. So, you know, so, to, so to help with this, I must mention that any sort of stones or debris that you may have in your plot, you need to remove those, right? Because those serve as a habitat for these, um, for slugs and your snails. Now, you just to set up a small trap for those, you just need, this is actually a soda bottle or a one gallon bottle, whichever, right? You need a bottle of beer. I mean, most men maybe will just drink this off before the slugs. And you just need some tree, some leaves, right? And your hand speed and a knife. Now, what you do, what you need to do is to basically to cut, cut this in half, or three quarters, just to cut it so it will hold the water. Now we're going to insert this now into the bed. So you select an ideal spot that, um, especially those spots that the slug is normally um, trespassed through. Right, and you dig a hole for the container. And you want the container to actually flush with the lever of the soil. Right, so you just gently cover by the air. All right, so you cover it so it flushes. Now, this is where we add what the slugs like, the beer. I just fill it about quarter to a half. And just to help in disguising this, disguising this, let's get some leaves, all right? I just, just gently cover it. I'll cover the air. Well, you can zoom in on this. It's actually a caterpillar. I can show you in a later picture. Alright, these are some of the insects that you look for. This is actually a caterpillar, which will just bite at your cucumber leaves. Right? So upon seeing those, 
If you don't want to touch it, you just get two stones. You just smash it. Right? And there, you're controlling your pest. So, we're just disguising this now. So what will happen is that when the slug is actually coming towards the plant, they will smell the beer, right? And in search of the beer, they will eventually just pass over here and falls in. And what they fall, once they fall in, they drop it in the beer. And they will try and co get, come out, but because of the plastic here, it's very hard for them to come out. So they will stay there and fall in and eventually drown, right? So, so in this, measure, this technique now, we, we can't, you can control most of your slugs and the snails within your field, right? Other small home ready, home ready um, techniques that we can use is neem. A lot of persons don't know neem, but it resembles, that, the leaves of it resembles that of a June plum, right? But I mean, then again, you check with your radar officer or your master gardener to help you to confirm whether a plant is neem or not, or to give a, a, a neem sample. Right? So with the neem, either the leaf or the seed from it, you can just allow it, just put it in the water and allow it overnight to, 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 to seep. Right? Or what you could do is to boil it. And afterwards, no, you, you pour that in your spray in your spray bottle and you allow you spray your plants. Right? So in, in, in practicing the home remedy techniques, just ensure that you don't wait until you see a lot of piss before you, do, you go ahead and do this, you, you spray with your home remedy pesticides. As quick as you see, a few of them, you apply. Here we have, if you look closely, you see a white fly. It fly gone, it fly gone. Oh, it didn't fly off. Let's see if we find out. Oh, come close up now. All right, here, what you see here, if you look closely, you see that's a small, soft body, um, aphid. Right? These are what transmit most of our diseases, the tobacco, H virus, and so forth. Right? So in seeing just a few of these, right, you can apply your, your soap, your soap, um, your soap solution or your, 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 your garlic and so forth to these because it's a soft body insect, so it will actually control these. Or what you could do upon seeing them, you just use your finger, smash. Once it's not enough, it's not a lot, and you're not going to, you're not going to take up most of your time. You just use your finger and smash, right? But otherwise, if you see a good amount, you just go ahead and spray with your home remedy, right? If it's a lot now, that will, 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 will be too much, so it will destroy your, your plants. You may want to revert to, 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 to use chemicals. Right, which in IPM it's basically our last option. We don't think about using chemicals unless we have to, right? Unless you reach to a stage where your, your field is totally infested and it's going to affect your crop. Less food for your family. If you sell your, 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 your crops, less food to sell and so forth. Once it's going to affect you, to, once it reaches to a particular level, that's the time that we start to think about using chemicals. Because in IPM, we want to reduce the amount of pesticides and so forth, the chemi especially the chemical pesticides that we use, in order to, to encourage to, a, a more friendlier environment to aid in the sustainability of um, our backyard garden, food production and so forth, right? And actually to save, uh, help on saving money, right? So we do, in IPM, we practice our cultural practices, we do our monitoring and so forth, to ensure that the pest level don't reach a level that we have to use um, pesticides. Now the time of which you apply your pesticides, whether your home remedy or your chemical based um, pesticide, is very important because you don't want to apply the spraying whenever rain is going to fall. Because if a spray and the rain fall, it just washed it off, right? So it doesn't make any sense. So please ensure that whenever you're going to spray, you have a fair day, well, r r little to no rainfall, preferably. Don't spray if you're going to get a lot of rainfalls. And um, I always spray in a cooler time, right? It, it helps to preserve even you, instead of going out there and spraying in the hot um, sun. 
spring the cooler time, the early morning or the late evening. I prefer the late evening. Reason being is that in the late evening, that's where most of the pests and so forth come out. That's when a lot of them start to do their work, in the late evening in the night. So you spring the late evening, the, the, the pesticide will be there now to work and control the pests, the, the pests as they come out. Right? So the timing is very critical in applying your spraying and so forth. So bear in mind those key points. Now, if you have to use chemicals, here are some guidelines that we must ensure that we follow in order to maintain the safety of them. Right? First and foremost, we have to ensure that we have our protective gears ready, right? When I speak of protective gears, I'm talking about your coverall. Ensure that your entire body is covered, right? So you're using your coverall here as a protective clothing. You also need these chemical gloves, which is basically rubber. And then using the gloves, I want to ensure you get these the long ones, all right? And it's best to cover, use the coverall to cover the, the outer part or the, the top side of the, 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 the gloves, all right? To prevent any chemical from falling here and dropping inside of the gloves. You want to prevent you getting in contact with the, the chemical as much as possible. You also need a goggles, protective goggles, to protect your eye from any splashing or drifting or spraying. And one key important thing that once you're using chemicals you need to have is this. Now this is known as a respirator. Something um, more advanced than a dust mask, right? It, uh, it, it basically filters the air, thus it prevents um, chemicals and so forth from passing to to actually get inside of you to inhale it, right? So these are basically the basic tools, our, our protective, protective gears that we need in applying um, chemicals. And they are simply, they are, they are simple to actually put on, right? So even before you even touch the chemicals and so forth, you want to ensure that you have these protective gears ready, right? And um, what I need to show you too, here we have a juice bottle. Never you will do this. Never have a juice bottle close to your chemicals and so forth. Because what you realize is that even maybe after spraying, you have a few leave over, you may want to put it in the bottle and so forth, which is not recommended. So we recommend you refrain from using the juice bottle itself. Right? The only part of the juice bottle that I would recommend is the cover. Now for most of these cover, it, it measures about one tablespoon, right? So in, instead of you buying a measuring cylinder and so forth, the cover itself will measure about one tablespoon to measure um, your chemicals. So with this, you can use this and go back um, in applying your, your, your irrigation to your field or you put it aside. If you look at it, it can even be planting, right? So. We put that aside for now. We don't want it to be anywhere close to the chemicals. So what we have here is basically different chemical base ranging from um, insecticides to fungicides and miticides, right? Um, this here is basically a neem oil, right? Which is one of those less um, hazardous chemicals which, which uh, we recommend you, you, you try to use these rather than the more hazardous ones, right? So this is, this is basically an ex extract from the neem plant itself, right? So, and one thing you have to ensure that whatever chemical you're buying, ensure that the direction of use is zero, and ensure, ensure that the label tells you everything about it. Don't buy chemicals in unmarked containers and so forth, because you're basically posing a threat a different to you set to yourself and uh, um, the wider environment. So you want it, want the, the, the label to show you the active ingredients and everything. Here, if you look closely, the active ingredients is basically neem oil. Realize it have eighty five percent of that, right? Alongside with others, but and this was made 
in Latin America. So these are some of the basic chemicals you have to ensure because each packet should have each packet should have its own information on it about the active ingredients and so forth. And on a, so some of them, the direction of use is on it. You have precautions and so forth, right? So don't buy any chemical which where, where, where these are not displayed on it, right? So in mixing, remember now, in mixing, what you need to do, ensure that you're well protected. So you need your eyes to be covered. And your face, your, your nose. But before I cover my nose, let me just say, it's best to do your spraying in the cooler part of the day too. Right? One, I mentioned before that insects come out, most insects come out late at night, uh, in the evenings. Right? And two, for you to be in a lot of these clothing and so forth, and to be in the hot sun to spray, it's very, make you very exhaust. So you, you, you don't want to, that to ha happen at all right so in getting before you, you open any packets or so forth remember read the label it will give you the direction of the amount to, to use per water per gallon of water or so forth or the amount per hectare right most of these chemicals um it displays like it, for example you use um five gallons per acre or so forth right but if, if, you, if you don't understand the label, remember, just call a radar officer, right? Or, or just ask a master gardener close by to you. And they will, he, will be able to help you to break it down so you know how much teaspoon to be added to a gallon of water or so forth. All right, this is 30 mil. 30 milliliter. And this is actually a, 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 a measuring um, device that we have here. It, it measures up to 120 milliliter. This is 30 milliliter of the agronomics with 8 liters of water, which is 2 gallon. Right? So, we need 30 mil of this to 2 gallon. Alright, so you're going to measure. If you didn't have this now, you'd have to convert it. It says one ounce to the two gallon of water. So 30 mil says one ounce. All right, cool. So this is a two gallon of water. See the imagery. And ensure that you close the bottle before you do anything else. So you want to prevent spilling as much as possible. Right? And gently. You need a stick to do your mixing. So as you pour, it just gently mix. And mix the dilute. I mix our boat. A minute or two to ensure that the solution is well mixed. So you can see the color change and thing. And this is actually what we use to apply. Spray. Oh. If you have a funnel, it makes it much easier for you to do the, 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 the mixing, the, the filling. So in this case, I have to gently. Remember, you don't have to fill it up because it was already mixed here. So. We're mixing. And we're ready to spray, right? So let me just give a quick demonstration here of how you'd go about spraying. So for this now, you don't want to spray only here. So you want to spray right around it. 
You got the lace? I'll just spray it under the lace. I don't want too much spray. And that's good. And if you realize the breeze is blowing this way, so you don't want to stay here and spray and it, it, it spray come back on you. But the spray it this way, you understand? You can spray it this end at the breeze, bring it there. Right? Likewise for any other cup. With drew proof, likewise, you do your spray. And you don't want to apply too much. So this is very handy for um, small backyard farming. I realize excess moisture instead of getting in contact with your skin so try to get in contact with this all right so it's good to wash these after spraying as well as, as well as take a bath exactly after spraying all right so i'm going to touch back I must say that also in applying chemicals you want to ensure that you have somebody close by to you right just just as a precaution in case of the, any emergency or so forth somebody can be there to help you and you also want to be as close as possible to running water because if any spillage may occur and it gets into your eye or so forth you must be able to quickly can go and wash it out right so those are some of the precautions, the safety tips as it relates to chemical application, right? So, as I said, if you have any questions or so forth about it, just call a radar officer. Just call a radar, right? Or just ask a master, a trained master gardener, and they'll give you the tips on how to use them safely. And remember, in IPM, the usage of pesticide is the last option that you should think of, right? Whenever, when nothing else works, that's when you should go towards this, or when your pest um, infestation level rises. Now, in, in crop production, in your backyard garden or containers, containers and so forth, one thing we want to refrain from doing is, is not to plant the same crop over and over and over again, right? Especially for, like, like for colorless here. This plot here may last you up to a year or more. Right? But after removing the after you remove all of these, we encourage that you don't plant back um callaloo because you want to reduce the, the, the amount of pest buildup that is there. Right? So you don't plant back callaloo. You plant a row of sweet pepper or hot pepper here. Or you plant a root crop like um to me um to, to potatoes or, 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 or carrots. Right? You don't want to plant back a leafy vegetable. You don't want to put back like pak choy here that you know that most of the pests that affects the color will just eventually gravitate towards the, 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 the other leafy vegetable. So you want to change this crop. So we encourage, it's also an, an IPM technique. That, it's also a culture practice that we call crop rotation. So you don't plant the same crop over and over. You plant color low now, after the color low crop, you plant sweet pepper. After the sweet pepper crop, you put in sweet potato. Right? And you just, it's just that rotation. So that will help to, 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 to trick the insects. So after the crop change, the insect won't have anything else to feed on. So they will actually stay there and die or they fly away. Right? So it reduces the, 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 the pest infestation level and the amount of money that you'd spend on chemicals and pest control. Right, so it's a simple measure that we use to reduce pest impact.